Okay, very good. So for those of you who are running out, I decided I should start my presentation with my three main messages so you can leave right away afterwards if you find that a bit boring. So. The first is that global solidarity is vital for managing the complex interrelated challenges facing human and planetary health. So very much following up on your question. And yes, indeed, The Lancet has started to pay attention to this. My second message is that moving forwards with a charitable approach does not provide us with the tools that we need to address these global problems in a systematic, effective manner. And thirdly, what I'm going to focus quite a lot of my talk on is that international human rights law provides some guidance. It doesn't give us all the answers. Nothing gives us all the answers. But it provides some guidance and can be useful for underpinning advocacy and pushing for sustained political will. Because law creates binding obligations on states. I tell my students that international human rights law is as valid as international investment law, but I know that if you speak to the black letter hardcore corporate lawyers, they're going to be trying to undermine any advances in human rights, indigenous law, environmental law, those counter hegemonic tendencies in, in law and trying to tr have trade deals, international investment schemes trump human rights law. But that is not the correct black letter approach, but it means that we need political will for human rights norms to be able to trump. So. Speaking of complex interrelated challenges, I wanted to bring up this really problematic slide, and that is that average life expectancy and CO2 emissions appear to have a degree of correlation. As we increase the CO2 emissions from a country because it develops economically, we see that people's life expectancy goes up. This is very bad news for the planet if that is the model that we continue to pursue for improving people's life expectancy. So we need to do something differently. If I turn to global health itself, the main challenge in global health, as we've heard from speaker after speaker, is that there is great global inequality. Many would say inequity. That is that at least 400 million people globally lack access to one or more essential health services, and that every year 100 million people are pushed into poverty and 150 million people suffer financial cata catastrophe because of out-of-pocket expenditure on health services. And what is financial catastrophe? It means that you can no longer send your children to school, that they end up working. You may decide to migrate, fall prey to human traffickers. So financial catastrophe is not just that you no longer have any money. It can, it can take your life very easily. And I also want to talk about this inequity of the global birth lottery. And I think probably everybody sitting in this room has been lucky about where they were born. It's not because we are skilled that we happen to be born to a family or a country that gave us education and, and health opportunities. And for my research, I've often focused on maternal and child health. And I find it to be particularly acute when we look at the lifetime risk of death in childbirth of the Democratic Republic of Congo, for women, one in 30. And the colonial state, Belgium, one in 7,500. We do the same comparison for Malawi and its former colonial ruler, the UK. You see the state in which colonialism left the countries that it purported to improve. So the Second World War brought us most closely to a complete wipe out of humanity. And this forced countries of the world to come together and think about global solutions. I think that the atomic age, the dropping of two bombs on Japan really shocked people as to what we could do to one another. The horrors of what had happened in Europe were another catalyst for really pushing people to change and try and change the, the system in which we operated. And we set up the United Nations. And we move towards different social protection models in different countries. Now, social protection models were set up because, as this quote says, market mechanisms, however well they function, do not guarantee a minimally acceptable standard of life if individuals or groups have insufficient assets. 
Transfers of assets or income are needed to deal with the moral obligation to guarantee this minimum standard. This was part of this post-war promise within the richer countries. But what about those countries that were not wealthy? Well, this is where international human rights gives perhaps a little guidance on how we can move forwards. So you start with the right to health. It's not a right to be healthy, but it is an international human right, and it is a legally binding international human right from the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights from 1966. And it requires states to realize, through domestic resource allocation and international cooperation and assistance, the right to health. So it has this dual financing source. Your country, through tax revenue, corporate tax, personal tax, captures enough money to be able to set up a health system. And for the countries that are unable to do this, either temporarily or for a longer period of time, they have the right to claim international cooperation and assistance. So the cooperation is not just money. Cooperation is also transfer of different technical knowledge. And I thought it would be interesting for you to have a picture of uh, how many countries in the world have ratified. That means not just negotiated and signed, it also means that they took that extra step of agreeing to be bound by these obligations. So the dark, darker blue shows the number of states that have ratified the International Covenant. You see, the United States is pale blue. They, they signed it under Jimmy Carter, but have never ratified it, so are not bound by this, unless you want to get into highly technical international law discussions about whether it is part of the Use Kogan's international law now, but we won't do that. The other important point of this is, if I show this to you, you think, oh, good, things should be all right. Well, we all know that they are not all right, and that shows you the weaknesses of international law international human rights law. The fact that the accountability mechanisms are very weak, which requires that we have political will. So I said that the project was to universalize human rights. Espion Eide, who is a very well-known Swedish former special rapporteur on the right to food, noted that there was this two-pronged strategy, again, where you push states after the Second World War to develop national human rights systems, social protection systems, and that you develop the global commitments to shared responsibility to insist those states that are unable to secure some or all of the rights of their citizens. So it's two components. So how have we tried to implement these two components? Well, I'm going to go to the classic right to health case of HIV AIDS and the ways in which we tried to use the right to health to mobilize support for access to antiretroviral treatment. So those of you, most of you here are not old enough to remember the 1990s when it seemed like HIV AIDS was an incurable disease, that at school you would be warned if you ever had sex you could get AIDS and you'd die, so you better never have sex, it's worse than being pregnant. But finally, through, I would say, a lot of help from pharmaceutical companies that managed to develop antiretroviral treatments at exorbitant cost, $20,000 per person per year when they were first rolled out, so only affordable for those in the United States and Canada who had enough money. Those people, particularly the gay community in the United States at that time, said that if one person has AIDS, everybody has AIDS, and that we are going to push the world to roll out HIV AIDS treatment for everyone. So it was this real concept of global solidarity coming from a feeling of being marginalized and the need to end that at the global level. So this idea of we all have AIDS if one of us does. But as we've talked about the global health security agenda, I thought it was important to mention that also at this time, the discourse was very strongly leaning towards a health security agenda as well. AIDS was seen as a security issue because it could result in the collapse of the economies of many African states if the pro there were projections on mortality rates. If those came to be true, there was a fear of global chaos. But the argument that seemed to win the day at that time 
was the human rights argument, the ethical argument. So how did we go about trying to do these things? Well, to be able to advance international human rights, the international human right to health, global solidarity, shared responsibility, we went forwards with health development assistance, which any of you who've studied it know that it is a huge mess. This slide is a, a huge mess because it shows the different competing overlapping actors who all advance different agendas. Even when they have a similar goal, they will have different monitoring, evaluation, reporting systems, which we know have an impact on the countries that engage in these projects. So I've talked about the legal solution, which is somewhat problematic. I want to now turn to looking a little bit at the political solution. And we've had a little bit about the sustainable development goal paradigm. So I'm not going to speak too much about SDG 3 and attempts to move forwards with universal health coverage, except in terms of how it's financed, because that's what I'm supposed to be discussing. Estimates by the Chatham House, a British think tank, at how, a, how much money a country needs to be able to finance universal health coverage. Most experts would agree that the basic minimum that a country needs to expend, so domestic resources available, or through international financing, would be $86 per person per year to be spent on health to afford the most basic set of health services. But a recent study by this Global Burden of Disease Health Financing Collaborator Network that, finan that projected financing, looking at both domestic resources through taxes and through international development assistance, projected that 35 countries are not on track to meet this minimal goal, the minimal goal of $86 per person per year to be able to provide the basic minimum of health services for every person in every country in the world. The money is there, it's just not distributed properly. So how do we finance the SDGs? If we know the money is there, how do we go about being able to raise not only the sufficient revenue, but also to be able to distribute it in a more equal, equitable way? Well, again, in the lead up to the SDGs, for some reason, the financing part of the SDGs came before they agreed on the goals. So it was like they agreed how much money they would have before they agreed on what they were trying to achieve. And this took place in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, where they agreed an agenda for action, a social compact, the normal stuff, routine stuff you'd expect to see, social protection systems, national spending targets, recommitting to this 0.7% of gross national income on aid. Very few countries, five, have achieved it. They also committed to collecting more taxes, fighting tax evasion, dealing with illicit financial flows, as we know that these are sources of income that are untapped, but they made no progress on an international tax body. I've worked as a tax lawyer. I know how easy it is for countries to negotiate tax holidays with, well, in my case it was with Slovakia, which is now an EU member state. They were very willing, the Slovak government, to give up their tax income for many years to get foreign direct investment. The same is true in countries that have less bargaining power even than Slovakia. So this is an area that I think we need progress on and that we can push the G7 and G20, international tax body that ensures that money doesn't flow to offshore accounts. They also called for an increased role for the private sector in achieving the SDGs, so taking it out of the public realm. And I think this critique of Maria Jose Romero of Eurodad this agreement opens the door for the private sector to use development money to generate profits, while the standards to ensure that companies comply with human rights remain non-binding guidelines. So I said before, they're not non-binding guidelines, but that is the way in which states interpret them. And that is where the problem lies, and that is why I find private sector involvement problematic. Not ruling it out completely, but states need to be strong enough to regulate the private sector. We also need to move forwards with institutions that are strong enough to be able to move forwards in global health. And I have done some work with a colleague, Gorik Ooms, on financing global health through a global fund for health. 
And how would that work? Well, you would use DAH, Development Assistance for Health, to finance global social health protection. And that little pale blue triangle that you see is where the development assistance comes in to try to be able to finance the money that a country is unable to raise domestically. So the countries that were projected to not have enough money to be able to spend $86 per person per year would be able to claim this money from the international community through a global fund that would then get rid of this messy international development assistance picture that I showed you before. I put this in here because I think that's the main message from most speakers here, that we need to renew global solidarity, that we need to move from development aid away from international cooperation, but more towards global solidarity, where we recognize that countries are interdependent, that we are members of a global society, that we share responsibility, and that we share resources based on universal rights and duties, those that you find in international human rights treaties. And so I go back to my three messages I gave you at the beginning, for anyone who's still awake, that again, global solidarity is vital to managing the complex interrelated challenges that the planet and human health face, that charity is not the way in which we're going to be able to, to manage these challenges, and that international human rights law provides us with some guidance. And anybody who's interested, I can give you many different authoritative sources in international law, because international lawyers like to spend a lot of time negotiating texts and writing them. So it can be useful for underpinning your advocacy to tell governments that they promised things and that they need to stand up to those commitments and that people will speak out if they don't, that we will march and that we will change things. So thank you very much. That's and I think it's